Laura, thanks for joining me on the Steadfast Running Podcast. Of course, thank you so much for having me today. It's an honor to be here. I'm so glad you accepted my invitation to be a guest on this show. I was sold on your credibility from the moment I first heard you talk on the Running Explained podcast. And I also love the let's science the bleep out of this run tagline on your website, lauranorrisrunning.com, which right off the bat brings up two questions. Mm -hmm. Is your goal to attract what I might call the cerebral type of runner? And more generally speaking, how do you hope your athletes feel both about themselves and about you throughout the relationship building process? That's a great question. Um, and first off, I have to give credit to my husband for coming up for that tagline. That was not my innovation. That was his. Um, he's read Andy Beer's The Martian a bunch and kind of co-opted it from that. Um, but in terms of the type of runner I like to attract, I certainly don't want to exclude any runner. But over the years, as I kind of coached and cultivated um, coach-athlete relationships, I found that a lot of the athletes who I worked best with um, were those more cerebral types. Maybe they had a background in STEM. Um, a lot of them had higher education degrees of some sort. And a lot of them were people with lots of questions about running, but also, you know, there's so much information out there where they would sometimes feel that like paralysis by analysis sensation, and they didn't want to feel that they just wanted to enjoy their running. And so that's where I've kind of niched myself. I feel in the coach athlete relationship is I want to help you understand your running, but we don't want to take the enjoyment out of running by overthinking things. Um, so it's kind of my job to help them through the guesswork and make sure that they understand what they're doing, but then at the end of the day, they enjoy their training and their racing. Yeah. As a coach, I'm curious about all types of coaching styles. And as much as I can diversify my own style, I try to do so. But as an athlete, I've always been drawn to those coaches who are immersed in the science and Every other sentence seems to have terms like lactate dehydrogenase in it, but yes. But okay, you fell in love with running your freshman year of college. And from there, it just evolved into a way of life. But I also know that you have a competitive side. Mm -hmm. What have you managed to accomplish from a performance standpoint? Yeah, so I, I do feel like my peak performance I, like I'm sure it will still be reached but in terms of recent years like between having a baby having COVID and some like long COVID issues that have since subsided and just moving a couple times I haven't really competitively raced um from 2018 to like I started getting back into it at the start of 2022 not quite where I was um but I've qualified twice for Boston CIM 2016 CIM 2017 um, but I feel like the real highlight was um, a couple times I once I podiumed second overall in a local 10K in Seattle, which Seattle wasn't like super competitive, but it also wasn't middle of nowhere. So that was a pretty proud moment. And another time I think I was eighth overall in a fairly not stacked, certainly not elite field, but fairly competitive field again in Seattle. In Boulder, it's a different story. No chances out here of reaching back to those levels. Between all the places that you've lived, Indiana, Seattle, um, Colorado, which place has been, would you say, the kindest to your running performances? Yeah, so I certainly performed the best in Seattle, but I feel like that was just the time of life and stuff. Quite honestly, I feel like Boulder is the most, most conducive for really fostering your potential. Um, yes, we get winter, but it's not horrible, certainly not compared to Indiana. You can pretty much train outside all year and you could train on any terrain you want to ask for. If you want flat, there's flat and fast. If you want to run up the side of a mountain, that's there and everything in between. And there's just an atmosphere of 
training and an enjoyable sense out here. Like one thing I've noticed, whether you're out running or gravel biking or hiking in Boulder is when you pass people, one of the most common things they say is enjoy. Like my husband gets it biking up the side of a mountain. I get it on runs. We get on hikes. People are saying enjoy and training is enjoyable out here. Yep. I'm jealous having lived and trained in Florida my entire life. So what does running do for you that makes you want to keep striving and not just striving in the way of getting in the miles every day, but striving towards excellence in a sport where that excellence demands this thoughtful, methodical, and consistent approach to training? Yeah, I think the most appealing thing about striving for excellence is ra- in running is there's not a time limit set on it. You know, most of us begin running as an adult or for me, a later teenager, but I certainly was competitive in college. And there's always this potential you can chase and you don't quite know when you're going to hit it. So you might as well keep trying. Like I coach athletes who are in their fifties and sixties and setting PRs. They might've started later in life in the sport, but they can still reach those goals. Or even if they're not setting PRs, focus on age group placement and stuff. So it's not like some other sports where there's an age limit on it or where the chances for competition decline as you age, as we see with some some other disciplines of sports. Like there's not tons of adult swim meets out there, um, for example. And so you have a toddler at home, Mm -hmm. you own a business, you are training for races, you're in grad school. So I think the million dollar question here is, and I ask on behalf of myself, where if I don't get up at 4 a.m. to run, it just won't happen, as well as many who are listening and probably wondering the same thing, how do you find the time and freedom to excel in all these areas? Yeah, well, I feel like first off, I have to like recognize that there is some certain privilege to that. Like my husband is incredibly supportive, his job has flexible hours where he doesn't go into the office to like eight to 9 a.m. because it's just like that in Boulder. Um, and so, and we have income where we can have like a house cleaner and stuff. I don't have serious medical conditions. So I feel like I have to recognize that, that my case isn't everyone's case. And I know it's not that easy for everyone, um, but I'm definitely there usually waking up at 5 a.m to even like, even if I don't get on a run right away, I start studying, check emails. Um, It's a lot of long hours, but it's sort of that passion driven long hours where the work doesn't feel like work because you're interested in it. Um, So I feel like that's really that passion. And then the support system I have are definitely kind of what makes it possible. I mean, I am getting up early and running before the toddler starts. Training volume is sometimes limited by that. Um, you know, on weekends, it's the trade-off of my husband's really into gravel biking. So it's like, got to make sure I get in my long run and he gets in his gravel bike and we balance it all with the family schedule. So not the whole day is spent just running and bike riding. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I have a treadmill for winter when it's a little too dark to run safely outside sometimes. So it, that makes it work. And then lots of sleep. Like you have to sleep well if you want to run well, work well, study well and balance all that. Because if you're tired, it just kind of all crumbles and your body falls apart along with it. Yeah, that's all well said, definitely. Looking ahead, what are your future goals as a runner? That's a great question. Um, So I'm getting back into the marathon after like a five year moving baby COVID moving hiatus. Um, And I just kind of want to see what my potential is in that sport. It'll be my first time racing at sea level after living and training at high altitudes. I'm just going into that very curious and open to see how it goes. You know, I'd love to PR, but we'll just have to see how that is. And then beyond that, I just want to keep chasing that potential, but also stay curious. So I think I would like to dabble in some trail races, maybe do a 50 K or something at some point. Um, And I feel like I'm at a point where I'm not super constrained to one goal or another because I'm kind of just taking it season by season of what sounds the most exciting 
in this 12 month block, like in the 12 months coming up and trying to think ahead, but not too far ahead, knowing that it could be in a few months. I'm like, yes, it's a 50 K. I definitely want to do go all in on that for a year and then kind of assess. Spoken like a good coach. So let's talk about your coaching career. And we all know that making that decision to become a coach takes a lot of confidence. And over time, I think it also builds confidence. So what was it about being a running coach that just clicked for you? Yeah. So before I was a running coach, I was actually taught fitness classes in undergraduate. Um, it probably wasn't the best setup. Like I wasn't certified to teach fitness classes, but it was just the university setting. They hired a few people for the job. I somehow got the job um, start of my sophomore year and I taught some fitness classes. Mine was actually um, for one year, the highest attended, like they had to put capacity on it because the room <laughs> filled up and I really, really enjoyed it. Um, it kind of combined a lot of things I liked, exercise, teaching. Um, at that point I was in school wanting to be a college professor. And then, you know, this is all during the recession. So when I graduated college, I went straight on to my master's. And then I realized that I just did not want to gamble on a PhD when the chances of it actually turning into a job were so slim at that time. Um, and so I kind of was like, what else did I enjoy other than teaching? And it was teaching fitness classes. Um, and I was running a good amount at that time. So I kind of at first looked into doing like group fitness instruction, um, personal training. But then what really appealed to me about run coaching was the, the freedom that came with it. Um, virtual coaching was already kind of a thing back then. I saw some people doing those models. And to me, what really appealed to that was being able to be in charge of my own schedule, being able to grow at the rate I wanted to grow and not being constrained by a gym schedule or you know how many classes I could teach. And so that was really the, the attraction for run coaching for me. The more I did it, the more I found that I really, really enjoyed it. And were there any mentors along the way that were there to show you the ropes? So I didn't necessarily have a mentor who was experienced, but I was really fortunate through just some connections I made in blogging to fall into a group of another coaches who were both all kind of novice, same level of experience in run coaching as me um, pretty early on, about a year into coaching. Um, and over, it's been what, then I guess like six years now, um, that group of coaches and I have met weekly, we've kind of grown together learn from each other where it's not necessarily a mentorship because it's not one of us exceeds the other in experience, but it's, you know, a mastermind collective where you're helping others grow as they help you grow. Um, I took some marketing classes along the way. And then a lot of it was kind of just learning as much as I could and trial and error. And you mentioned taking a marketing class. So from a growth and marketing standpoint, how did you grow your business to the extent that you coach as many people as you do now? Yeah, so I'm certainly not like a master class in marketing. There are some close coaching friends I have who far excel at it compared to me. I don't have a super large Instagram. My website, I would say, is moderate traffic compared to some other ones out there. Um, but what I did was I consistently put out content even when it wasn't getting a lot of views or shares at first. And I put it out when it wasn't perfect. And I think that's a big thing for coaches is you think, oh, I should wait until I've perfected my craft. You definitely want to have experience. You want to have an understanding of what you're doing, but expertise comes with practice. So you just have to put yourself out there and be willing to know that at some point you might say, hey, I was wrong in the past. And you have to be like, I learned better from this. And to have other points where you'd be like, well, that content was correct, but it wasn't presented great. And so I kind of just did that. I put things out there. I got a few athletes. Those athletes grew through referrals. Um, I would share their successes on the website. And then I feel like I've had a lot of athletes with me for three to five and a half years now. And a lot of that spurs growth when you create 
a relationship with a person, not just as an, not just as a runner, but as like a person and you support them through the ups and downs. And then that kind of grows like people, I think ultimately they want a coach to help them in their running, but they also want someone to be there on the journey with all its ups and downs with them. And I think that's where my coaching has had its best marketing is just, it's not intentional marketing. I'm there for my athletes because they matter, but people see that and they're drawn to that. And so it's, I guess the best way to say is marketing can sometimes come from who you are as a coach, not necessarily from a strategy that you find in a business textbook. Exactly. It comes from a place of authenticity. Could yes. you, uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's exactly it. Could you, Laura, describe the populations that you've worked with since you started coaching and maybe any stories that jump out at you, maybe because it taught you something about yourself or because it taught you something about the coach athlete relationship? Um, could you repeat that, please? My internet just seemed to have gone out. Yeah, sure. So can you describe the populations that you've worked with since you started coaching and maybe a story or two that jumps out at you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in terms of populations, I have worked with all sorts of runners, um, young 20 somethings who are just beginning more experienced master runners, but I would majority of my athletes um, are in the range of, you know, 30s and 40s, where they've been running for a while, and they want to both get better, but they want to keep doing it for a long time in a sustainable way. So kind of that intermediate level recreational runner, some advance, and maybe getting faster is their goal, but it's not just about getting faster. They're not necessarily in the like BQ or bust mindset. They want to get there, but they want to enjoy the process. Um, so I feel like that's, that's the population. And some that, that jump out at me, like I think of some athletes I've had, I had one gal come from a collegiate background. Um, and over the years, like her goal was to BQ and she was about 15 minutes off. And we brought her to the point where she, after having a baby, she was second woman overall at a marathon in Ohio and like absolutely surpassed the BQ standards. That's one that I, I think of. Um, I've had some athletes who've been with me and their journey has been like one in particular I think of. She started and she came to me for her first marathon. And over the years, our journey has brought where she did her first 50K and she found that trails were just absolutely what she loved. Long distances on the trails were what she thrived in. Yeah, and watching your athletes thrive, it can be so rewarding uh, from the coach's standpoint as well. I think if you compare any two good coaches using a Venn diagram, for example, you'd have some overlapping traits that we can all agree are important. For mm -hmm. example, expertise in his or her sport or event area or someone that is heavily invested in your well-being as a whole person would be another trait, but you'd also find idiosyncrasies that many people would find reassuring. So how would you describe your way of relating to other people or to put it another way, your style of coaching? That's a great question. Um, so I feel like for myself, coaching, it always is person first, runner second, like seeing the athlete as a whole, but being like r running will be there. So, you know, if something hurts, let's take a few days off to assess it. If something's injured, let's take time off to treat it. If you're in a lull, let's just kind of back off training and guide through that. And just as a coach, you inevitably walk through a lot of up and downs with athletes. It affects their training you see people go through really tough things like unexpected death of parents, miscarriages, divorces, all sorts of trauma. And a lot of times with coaching, it's just essentially being there and being supportive with them and also letting them know that it's okay at that point if they wanna push really hard in their runs or if they just want time off or such because they're people and kind of framing everything like that in the long term. that we take care of ourselves in the short term so that we can thrive 
both as a person and a runner in the long term? Yes, and this next question may not apply to online run coaching as much, but I'm also in the youth sector mm -hmm. in the school um, setting. And maybe from one coach to another, you can give me some advice. How do you suggest dealing with special needs cases? For example, someone is being non-compliant or someone lacks motivation or is not open to communication, might even be a little disrespectful or toxic towards the culture that you're trying to create. What are your thoughts around that? Yeah, I mean, special needs cases are definitely, I think, one of the biggest challenges in coaching. And oftentimes working through them, I think that's where having a support network of other co coaches to bounce ideas off of can be valuable because you might be looking at something, looking at, say, a non-compliant person, and it might be informed by your own bias, your own history, your own experiences with why you wouldn't comply with a plan. And it might be actually completely different. And so sometimes first having a few other coaches to bounce that off can be really helpful and insightful. Then I think always, you know, it helps to understand, is there something going on beyond running behind all this that is causing that non-compliance or disrespect or something? I think we can see a lot that maybe an athlete had a toxic relationship with a previous coach. And even as they reach out and they trust you, that past experience molds their behaviors now. I think with things like non-compliance, it can be what's going on in life beyond running. Um, sometimes for some athletes, even things like seasonal affective disorder or depression and anxiety can cause non-compliance. And it's not out of disrespect to the coach or coaching plan. It's something the athlete's working through and they need a coach who can be compassionate and not just like, you need to go get your run done, but to be like, walk me through what's going on. I think with youth though, it's tricky because parental and societal expectations can really come in and shape their motivation and reaction into sport. And that layers a whole different level of complexity than we, I mean, we certainly would see pressure, including social media pressure, peer pressure come in on adult athletes, but it's different with youth, I think. Absolutely agree. It's a complex issue. And like you said, a lot of these special needs cases, there's something else going on. And you just need to find support for those kids or those athletes. So th thank you for that. Um, as far as online coaching is concerned, I think online coaching can work really well for the athlete that has a lot of the pieces already in place, minus the mastery of training concepts, or maybe the accountability factor. Can you talk about what you think are some of the challenges of online coaching? Absolutely. So I think one of the hardest things in online coaching, um, well, I mean, first off, you're not there as like in-person accountability. And for some runners, that is the barrier. I've seen it most often, I think when people come and they're like, I've never run before. I wanna run a marathon in 12 months. I need someone to motivate me out the door. Online coaching might not provide them what they need at that time. And that's through no fault of their own. That's through no fault of their coach. It's just mismatched needs. So sometimes if you need someone to get you out the door, it might be better to see an in-person coach or find a training group. But then the hardest thing with online coaching, when you get into the runners who are matched well, their needs match online coaching well, is a lot of runners are very type A. They want to check all the boxes, but there are times where the best thing isn't to check all the boxes. There are times where it's actually best in a workout to not do the last rep if form is completely falling apart and the athlete is overreaching. And in online coaching, you have to do your best to equip your athlete with the tools to make that informed decision themselves. But there's a lot of reasons why they might not make that decision. And it comes down sometimes to type A or perceived expectations. And you're not there in person to tell them, no, that's enough for today. Let's quit while we're ahead. Yeah, 
Yeah, and, and there are, of course, um, many good reasons to pursue online coaching um, as, as long as it's the right fit for you. So I, I agree with everything you said. And we've already talked about the impact that we can have on our athletes and how maybe we would like to be perceived. But I'm curious what you would say about the impact that athletes have had on you? That's a great question. So I feel like over the years working with athletes, it's certainly taught me to be more compassionate to people's life situations and more understanding that things can take time. And it, it sort of breaks you out of maybe a more closed mindset into a more open one. I think when you begin coaching, it's, and this is just part of the beginning process, you have your own worldview that might be very limited. And along the way, you encounter people very different than you. Their motivations might work different. Their life situation might work different. And you have to break out of your worldview and learn to be more compassionate and more creative sometimes. Because what is perfect programming in a textbook is not perfect programming for the working mom of three with time constraints who wants to do a marathon. And so you have to learn to be creative as well as compassionate in those scenarios. Um, and I, I think that's just the biggest evolution coaches have to, to go through in growing from their athletes is each athlete you encounter is a, a different person with a different background, motivation and life circumstance right now. Very well said. Yeah, you, be, you have to become more compassionate, more creative, and just by extension, you become a problem solver. Exactly. So and that's a lot of what coaching is, is it's problem solving, not just in programming together the training plan, but in mental hangups for athletes and getting people past obstacles and stuff. And sometimes even just working with people's schedules. It's, it's a lot of problem solving. What's one mistake that you've made as a coach? And we all make mistakes, right? So <laughs> maybe one that you can think of off the top of your head that others listening can learn from. Yeah, so I think when I was starting out as a coach, as many new coaches are, rules are very safe. And there's a reason we have rules, but they're more importantly, it should be thought of as guiding principles, not yes, no, black, white, definitive rules. But I feel like when I began coaching, I thought of them as definitive rules a lot. And so what I often think of as the biggest mistake was, you know, you hear the, the rule, easy runs should be one to two minutes per mile slower than marathon pace. And I remember when I was a novice coach back in, it would have been like 2016 within my first 12 months of coaching, I was very constrained to that. And so I had some marathoners who were probably finishing in the four and a half to five hour range, but I wanted them to stick to that rule. Well, that's practically walking on your easy runs, or at the very least, severely disruptive to good biomechanics. Now, when I have those athletes, easy runs are virtually marathon pace because looking at it from a physiological perspective, it might even be slightly faster because when you're working with five hour marathoners, that's not marathon pace as we think about it for three hour marathoners. It's all still conversation pace. And so that stands out in my mind, but just graduating from having constraints of rules to being able to understand physiology better. And physiology is very nuanced and messy. That's a great one. Um, and we're gonna be talking about training here in just a bit. But for marathoners in that time range, absolutely, they don't really have a marathon pace. They're, I mean, due to their poor aerobic development, their easy pace is their marathon pace. So I think that's a, a great point. Now, apart from your course load, which is probably enough, to be honest, what sources of continuing education do you intentionally seek out to help you become a better running coach? Yeah, so I follow a lot of exercise physiologists on Twitter. Like pretty much my Twitter feed is exercise physiologists and like Boulder County open space. So you know when there's a moose in town. 
um, which actually happens out here, but that's beside the point. So I follow lots of physiologists on Insta or on Twitter. That's where they share their latest studies. That's where some debates are held, funny enough. That's where you can see what's going on in the latest research. And I think it's really important to stay on top of that because endurance training is a booming field in research right now, especially more like nuanced topics like training intensity distribution and periodization and all that stuff. Um, I have PubMed alerts set up. So every month I get email alerts from PubMed with a few search terms. I probably should add more to that. Um, and then I simply read a lot and consumed a lot of information. So I would read as many books as I could get my hands on. I exposed myself to all the training theories out there. Even if they're ones I don't use at all, I exposed myself and I read them. And then there, there's been a few like podcasts along the way. Um, the um, For a while there, the Steve Magnus on coaching one was one I listened to a ton. That, that one's kind of the other host has kind of gotten into some interesting ideas lately. So I haven't listened to that as much, but Steve Magnus has, I think another podcast out there and his works are great. And then um, David and Megan Roche have a podcast somewhere called Play, and it's a fantastic source of keeping up with studies, training theory nuance, even for road runners, they're, they're trail running based. Um, I'm trying to, yeah, I mean, just you, you read everything you can get your hands on. You expose yourself to everything, even if it sounds ridiculous, and you just never stop learning. Yeah, reading and my... Um... And podcasts are my go-to sources as well. I'm actually reading or rereading, I should say right now, Running Science by Owen Anderson, PhD. Yes, uh, I have that one. Recommend that to our listeners as well. So let's have some fun now. Let's, mm -hmm. let's talk about training. And so from an exercise physiology standpoint, Let's go through the major key performance variables, you know, like lactate threshold, velocity or maximal running speed, running economy, et cetera, et cetera. And maybe as you, as you cite them, uh, give a brief definition of what they are. Yeah, and I'm sure I'm bound to probably say something without the proper nuance here. I apologize to anyone more educated than I who's listening. Um, and I'm going to use the language that is typically used in popular running literature, not the language that we're using over here in academia, because it is differing and it can be confusing. So I want to be clear on that. We're going to use what you'll typically encounter in books. Um, so first to begin, there's maximal oxygen uptake or VO2 max. This is essentially the maximum amount of oxygen you can consume, and it puts in place your aerobic capacity limit. Um, when people talk about VO2 max training, it's also synonymous with aerobic power training. It's very, very fast, usually around, you know, like 3K race effort for most recreational runners, but still predominantly aerobic. We don't have more anaerobic contribution than you have aerobic. Um, but it's just that point where this is your aerobic ceiling. That's a good way to think of it, aerobic ceiling for most people. Then you also have velocity at VO2 max, which can get kind of confusing for some people, but that just essentially means how fast you're running at your VO2 max. Your VO2 max won't heavily change with time. That's measured um, in like liters of oxygen consumed, but your velocity at VO2 max can improve over time. And that relates to the next um, big marker, which is running economy. And running economy, the easiest way to think about it, this is very overused, but it is the easiest, is fuel efficiency. It's how efficient you are at using oxygen at sub-maximal, so below VO2 max paces. The better that is, the better everything up to your velocity at VO2 max will be. Um, now you have supra-maximal running also. So that's very heavily anaerobic. You know, that's the kind of stuff you see in short distance and middle distance racing. Long distance runners don't often touch that stuff, except for when they do things like strides and sprints, um, you know, 10 to 20 second burst of fast running. Um, but still for most runners, they're looking at improving their running economy when they're doing those. So all just about 
being more efficient at using oxygen, at moving your body efficiently and that stuff. Um, running economy is really complex, but I'm not going to get into like all the layers of it. I don't, I'm not going to say I'm an expert on it or like fully understand it or anything, but it, it's both metabolic and mechanical is essentially what's partially going on there. Um, then you have um, lactate threshold. Um, in exercise science, you might really see this called maximum lactate steady state or second lactate threshold or lactate inflection point. But when we talk about lactate threshold in like typical training language, it's the point at which your body tips over and it begins to produce more lactate that it can clear. Um, and that accumulation of lactate is accompanied by an accumulation of hydrogen ions, um, inorganic phosphate and other metabolites. And it begins to elicit a few physiological responses that cause fatigue. Now lactate's not a big bad. We want to have it in training and we want to raise our lactate threshold to run faster at paces at and below that. Um, interval training can improve lactate threshold and tempo runs, threshold training, improve lactate threshold. Um, and it is a big marker of performance in long distance running events. Think about that burning feeling that slows you down a lot. Um, and essentially when you improve your lactate threshold, you teach your body to more efficiently shuttle it because your body can actually use it to produce energy via gluconeogenesis. So it takes that lactate, turns it back into ATP, adds an extra energy source. Um, that's kind of the goal of all those trainings. Then below that, there is what we commonly hear in the literature as aerobic threshold is what we'll call it in the popular training world. Um, in the exercise science literature world, they call that lactate threshold. That's where it can get really confusing, but it's also first ventilatory threshold, first lactate threshold. It's um, where you would have about two millimoles of lactate per liter um, produced and this is kind of that point where you begin to use more carbohydrates than fatty acids and energy production. You're not anaerobic by any means, um, but you're, you're putting in a little bit more work. For some people, this is kind of near marathon pace. For some slower runners, it might be closer to half marathon pace. You can still sustain it for a pretty long time. Uh, another big predictor of endurance performance. And then we have what we colloquially call easy running, low intensity running, um, conversation pace, which is all prime, like pretty much entirely aerobic, no anaerobic contribution and uses a little bit more fatty acid than that. Um, you know, there are other factors like VO2 kinetics, um, all sorts of stuff that come in, but that's kind of how you would see training tier, like physiology determinants most commonly described for long distance running without getting into complicated things like force output and all the physics of it. All right, we're off to a great start here. That's bioenergetics in a nutshell, but like a great teacher who is able to make complex things sound simple, I think you did that for us. Yeah, you covered the spectrum there of uh, training zones. So when it comes to training theory, are there any luminaries that you tend to follow with a little bit more zeal than the others? As in maybe you follow this school of thought over here, uh, not completely, but that you lean more towards one school of thought over another. Yeah, um, so there, I definitely follow a lot of the academics behind what has been distilled into 80-20 running, but I don't necessarily follow, like the school of 80-20 running is something that's a very simplified concept. So I don't necessarily follow that. I use it sometimes, don't always use it, but the great minds behind training intensity distribution, um, Dr. Steven Seiler, Dr. Este Lano, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, Dr. Casado, all those great training intensity minds are definitely ones I closely follow, see what they're doing, see what their research is finding. Um, along with a lot of other ones. Um, Steve Magnus's book, Science of Running and all his stuff has been, it's fantastic, especially in understanding some of the more mechanical aspects of training, um, like muscle tension theory and all that stuff and some of the nuances. Um, and then Megan and David Roche from Some Work All Play have a great understanding of 
training theory in terms of like real life distribution. Like when you have an athlete who's running a trail race or running on hills, which, you know, you do a lot in marathon training, especially for certain ones, what does that actually look like? Because it's not this clear cut dry. Um, they also have a lot, the Roches have a lot of stuff on how to improve running economy that quite honestly, more road coaches should use because um, even before I encountered them, if some stuff I had picked up from the scientific literature after I encountered their work, started using it even more, but things like little bursts of speed, which is heavily supported in scientific literature pays off really well for long distance runners. And I'm sure there's other academics out there, um, you know, in terms of like sports nutrition, um, Trent Stellingworth, Louisa Burke are huge influences on how I kind of think about that part of training for people. Um, and I forget who's really been the big names of strength and conditioning that I found really influential, but in terms of like more accessible stuff, like Mary Johnson's stuff on lifting for runners has been tremendously helpful in how I've interpreted the literature and thought about it practically. That's fascinating. And I can see, I'm not sure, I wouldn't say you're biased, but you, you know how you rely more on the exercise physiologists of the world. For me, it was, it was the old school coaches that got me into this, the, um, you know, the Lydiards and, mm -hmm. and the Joe V Hills. And, and it was through them that I then discovered um, the exercise physiology take that, the, the modern way of approaching training. And I think it's really interesting about Lydiard and V Hill, and even ones that were more out there like Egoli, is that some of them weren't really far off, even without the advancements of science that we have. Like that science and physiology definitely has a role, but then part of coaching is still the experimental side of science where you have a hypothesis. You're like, I think training this way is going to make my athlete better. And you test that hypothesis. And that's what people like Lydiard were doing. They were testing hypotheses. And then they saw things like, wow, aerobic capacity really matters. And like the science feeds back and forth with that. I think especially a lot of the work we've seen come out of 2022 has been looking at not just what do we see in the labs, but how do we see elite athletes train? And it's kind of a cycle like that feeds back and fourth, science, actual training, science, actual training. Exactly. Well said. So now if we're going to talk about your pillars or your big rocks of training, and I understand this is, you know, you, you could write a book about this. So just in general, what, what are those major principles that you hold dear? Yeah. So these are just in no order. <laughs> so I apologize for like the fact that they're not building upon each other or very like tiered. Um, so the first training pillar I have is um, variety. We want to work on all physiological systems at a certain point in our macro cycle or however we wanna divide it. You don't wanna ne ever neglect a certain, certain system for too long. Even if it doesn't seem the most sport specific, generally it's still beneficial for a long distance runner. Obviously training will go through periodization where some systems may be stressed more than others, but we don't wanna leave anything behind because all those systems play off each other. The next kind of build on that, I guess, um, and that's less specific to most specific when training for a goal race. Obviously not every race is a goal race. And again, we don't wanna leave anything behind, but when you're in the eight, 10 weeks before your big race of the season, you wanna be doing more specific work to the physiological demands of that race, at least in my theory. And to get in the other systems, you use those when you're further out from the race. Um, so to kind of put that in context, like my marathoners will often do a lot of interval work at the start of their marathon cycle, and then work more into threshold and marathon pace work. If you were to have a 5k runner, it would almost be completely flip-flopped. Um, obviously, like if you get into nonlinear periodization, which I do sometimes for some people, gets a little messy, but still less specific to more. Um, coming off of that, you know, we want variety. We want to have less specific to not. Um, a big pillar of mine is if I have an athlete who's focused on performance, we do not neglect intensity. We're not hanging out doing only easy running. 
We are training biomechanics as well as all aspects of bioenergetics. Um, obviously, if you're just wanting to be a beginner runner or you just want to run to keep running, your training is going to look different. Um, that comes then to individualization. Training is individualized to the demands of the individual's life, to their fitness background, to their goals, along with some other things. Um, then there comes to, I guess the best way to put this is working outside your comfort zone. I try to encourage my athletes not to avoid certain stimuli just because it's uncomfortable for them or not in some way. So I guess a good way to put this is get off the treadmill if you prefer the treadmill, get the feeling of running outside, run up hills, even if it raises your heart rate and that kind of makes you feel weird on an easy day about it. Um, put yourself outside your comfort zone. And then finally, eat enough. Like there's huge research now that overtraining might be the same as energy deficiency. Obviously it's not that simple, but you're holding yourself back and your training won't be as well absorbed if you don't nutritionally support it. Yeah, so that, that's a good synopsis and gives me a chance to inject uh, a little anecdote here. When I first started following a Lydiard system, I completely misinterpreted it. And so that's one of the coaching mistakes that, that I made because I didn't have variety or enough variety in the program. It was just a lot of easy running, which I thought was building an aerobic base, which in a way it was, mm -hmm. but we weren't addressing uh, the neuromuscular aspects of running. And, and you know, granted Lydiard was running up hills. And where yeah. I was, there are no hills. Um, so yeah, good, great points. Now we often hear, and, and it's true, that there is no single optimal way to train for everybody. And that's where the individualization comes in. Would you say, however, that there are some definite training errors that we should all stay away from? Oh yes, absolutely. Um, so the first is going too hard too often. It's a very common mistake amongst, I would say, intermediate trained runners where training of beginner is completely different. But once you kind of are introducing more variety, if you go too hard on your easy days, you're going to fatigue yourself too much. You're going to deplete too much glycogen and you're going to probably increase your risk of injury. Um, so that's a definite mistake. Next is not taking rest days. It's a very common mistake for a lot of runners. They're like, oh, it's just a 30 minute easy run. But rest looks a lot different for recreational runners than elites. We have more demanding jobs. We're usually more engaged in things throughout the day. You need to have a rest day. And that's just one of the biggest, biggest mistakes I'll see runners make. Um, and then the next, I mean, almost kind of like you said, it's so easy to skip the little things like strides and just let the neuromuscular system just like, whatever, I'm not a sprinter, doesn't matter. It does matter. Like without getting into the physics of it too much, like running faster isn't just increasing your cadence and increasing your um, stride length. It's increasing the force output of each stride. And so you need to train your neuromuscular system to have the right neural drive to go into be able to actually output enough force in that. So things like strides and hill sprints, they seem so short that they almost seem pointless to some runners, but they yield huge dividends, especially when done consistently. Yes, and it can also um, shield you or protect you from injury. That's something mm -hmm. I, I learned the hard way. So now what is something that you talk about or include in your training plans that might otherwise not be there if it weren't for your science background? Yeah, so um, that's, that's a great question. So I feel like my science background has informed a lot of things. Um, one thing is I do pay fairly close attention to um, training intensity distribution more than I did before my science background. So like when you're a new coach, it's really easy to be like, oh, 80, 20 is super popular, but it's so much more nuanced than that based on periodization of training. So you'll have times that are high intensity, low volume, 
you'll have times where you might be in pyramidal distribution, which is kind of, you know, like 70 ish percent easy, 20 um, ish percent moderate, 10 percent hard, or even slightly less hard, slightly more moderate. You'll have even times where you might push the moderate really hard in preparation for a marathon. And I feel like really staying, trying to stay up on the literature of training intensity distribution pushes coaching in a way that disregarding physiology might not. And then also like, I feel like I am actually a little sometimes more relaxed on certain things than coaches without a physiology background. Like I have a lot of athletes who will say, my heart rate got up when I ran uphill on this easy run. It came back down, but it was temporarily, according to my Garmin in zone three, is my run ruined? And I'm like, no, you are training good biomechanics running uphill, like intensity zones. A, we don't even know if you're calculating them right based on how difficult it is to calculate heart rate. Two, it's not like, like there's a good plan. We'll have a little bit of wiggle room around moderate zone running in my theory. Um, because you want to run hills and hills will naturally put little spurts of moderate running in there. So I always kind of build an athlete's plan, telling them to get on hills and accounting that in their training intensity distribution. I don't have my athletes walk up hills, even if their heart rate gets high, unless it's like a super steep hill and they're on the trails where their biomechanics are falling apart because I want them to have good biomechanics as well as good bioenergetics. Yes. Yes. And as you pick up the pace or as training intensity increases, um, something happens in our, in our cells, right? And I wanna talk about the two glycolytic pathways, aerobic glycolysis and anaerobic glycolysis. One, in one case, glucose is converted to pyruvate, it enters the Krebs cycle, and that's how you get your, your energy, your ATP. And then the anaerobic, maybe I'll let you pick up from there. But after you explain anaerobic glycolysis, and the reason I'm bringing this up is, what do you think are the implications of this process when we're running too fast? Maybe we're going from zone one to zone two. Lactate is starting to build up. And the associated, you know, hydrogen ion concentrations, the, the metabolites that induce fatigue. Is there, is there a takeaway here for runners? Yeah. And that's zone one and two on a three zone scale, just to make sure. I, yes. Correct. I'm, okay. Yes. On the three zone scale. Um, yeah. I mean, so anaerobic glycolysis in, in simplicity is, um, glucose is, goes through this whole series of steps and it becomes pyruvate. And in the absence of adequately available oxygen, it then um, does not enter the Krebs cycle, which is all aerobic. And it instead produces lactate. And with lactate um, and all those cellular level reactions going on come hydrogen ions and organic phosphate, et cetera, metabolites. Um, this happens on a spectrum. And I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind is even, you know, if you're like at your aerobic threshold, it's going to be happening, but at a point at which your body can still clear that lactate, it can shuttle it back into the cell, put it through gluconeogenesis, use it for more energy. And then there's inflection points where all of a sudden you're, you're working just hard enough where you can't clear it efficiently and it begins to accumulate. And you can often feel it when it accumulates through peripheral fatigue, which means essentially like your muscles, your muscular system's fatiguing. Your brain might not feel super fatigued and your lungs might not. I mean, they probably actually will though because <laughs> different things going on there, but your muscles are gonna have that burning sensation. Um, it's really important to note that this pretty much all stops once you stop running. So lactate's not, is not what is making you sore after a run, it's just what's making your muscles burn. And it's not even lactate making your muscles burn. It's the hydrogen ions and inorganic phosphate and how they interact with things like calcium ions and muscle contractions and stuff. Um, but that's what's happening. So it, it's when you're working hard and you feel, feel things burn, like a good reference point for when it, the metabolites and lactate really accumulate is our race pace 
which is, you know, like you, you, you feel pretty uncomfortable during that, or it's, you know, moderately hard, but not all out, certainly a few more gears. Um, in terms of doing that too often on certain days, it really actually depends on the runner's experience. Um, so other coaches would disagree with me on this. I think if you're a novice runner, like you're completely untrained, you're brand new to running and you tinker, you teeter into zone two most days, that is being a novice runner. Your cardiac system literally is not adapted enough to have enough stroke volume to get enough oxygen to your muscles to meet the demands. And there are a lot of physiologists that actually argue that a lot of zone two training is actually really beneficial for novice athletes. I think it was I'm going to butcher their names. So I apologize. Um, Sagal and Shkrylik and one of their 2015 reviews um, talked about like zone two training for novices actually kind of helps them benefit. And I know that's the theory of some coaches is like faster and aerobic stuff is beneficial for novices because you're getting good biomechanics. You're training your body. If you were to try to go into zone one, you'd be walking as a novice. Um, now, when we get to trained athletes who have more variety in their training, different intensities. You don't want to go too fast every day like that because essentially what you're going to start doing is you're going to kind of put your body to a point where recovery becomes more difficult. And since you have harder sessions and higher volume that are necessary for endurance training, it's too much for your body to recover from. We all want to be in this point of functional overreaching throughout training to get better. We deliberately target that at certain points, but you go too hard on your easy days and you begin to teach and teeter into non-functional overreaching. And if you're in that long enough without course correction, it's overtraining, um, which essentially is performance plateaus and mood disruptions and all sorts of undesired stuff. Um, too much time in zone two also, since we're using more carbohydrates via anaerobic glycolysis, um, you would tire out too soon for the demands of your training volume. You would be unable to maintain the training load necessary for your goals. And you probably would be just really fatigued all the time from depleting more glycogen and not fully replacing it. And so that's the biggest concern for most runners. It doesn't always have to be perfectly that you only spend this percentage of time. It'll vary based on your thing, but you just don't wanna go there on days that are not purposely intended to go there. Beautiful. And what you described earlier is that lactate shuttle theory that was made popular or described by George Brooks in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. um, and for what it's worth, I'm a big proponent of zone two training. And for me, that means everything between LT1 and LT2. However, with the caveat that every workout should have a goal or a purpose. And so when I have a threshold workout on the schedule, that's what we're shooting for, that mm -hmm. those zone two paces. But what I don't like and what I see often is when runners do this on an easy day or on a oh, recovery yeah. day. And that's when I say, okay, you need to be in zone one for, oh, yeah, this, absolutely. for this session. And I just interviewed, by the way, Jason Retz, um, great coach in, in Illinois, high school coach. And he distinguishes in his system between an easy run and a recovery run. And so there you have a great example of, here's the purpose of the workout recovery run, you go easy, truly easy. Now on an easy run, and I know the nomenclature there can get a little confusing, but on an easy run, you can pick up the pace. Maybe you're going to be running right around that aerobic threshold, um, but that's okay because we recovered yesterday. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Like there's a lot of, you know, per, every workout should have a purpose. That is the best way to explain is what you just said. And there are days where, you know, you're recovering from the hard workout and you're probably just going to shuffle along super slow, but on easy run days, like I personally don't quite like the heart rate training methods because I think it honestly keeps some runners too slow on their easy days. And I know you could argue that you can't go too slow on your easy days. And that's true, but there's actually a lot more 
bandwidth in zone one than some training systems lens. You're certainly not going out at like marathon pace every single day, but it's not, okay, go barely run, you know, shuffle for every single easy run. And this just popped into my head, Laura, but maybe you can help clarify these terms because coaches will often use terms like lactate clearance workout. And in the same breath, or maybe they'll say instead of lactate clearance, they'll say lactate tolerance. Can you can we distinguish between lactate clearance and lactate tolerance? I'm going to try as best as my physiology knowledge goes. Sometimes I will admit I get confused by the nomenclature some coaches use. And sometimes I think there is jargon padding to kind of make one seem smarter. But in my interpretation, a lactate clearance workout would be we're wanting to get that lactate shuttle improved, clear that lactate out more efficiently. Um, one thing that pops to my mind with that is cruise intervals, you know, where you're going around at threshold effort, but you have short little breaks in every once in a while to just clear it out. Um, again, different coaches might defend it, def define it differently. Maybe you're also working like 10 K effort. I find that I personally like to do a lot of critical velocity training for my runners to have them work, you know, accumulate a little bit, clear it out on the recovery lactate tolerance in my interpretation. And again, I have been wrong in the past, I could be wrong here, would be something like a continuous continuous threshold run where you're teaching yourself to ride right at that point of production and then tolerate it for a continuous period of time. Learn how to control your effort just enough so you're not overproducing and then teach yourself to kind of get a little bit uncomfortable with that prolonged moderate discomfort. Yep, yep, that's that's kind of how I see it too. Lactate clearance for me is traditional threshold training where you're still hovering over LT2 and you're taking advantage of that lactate shuttle system. Mm -hmm. But once that lactate accumulates and you're well over now your anaerobic threshold. So any running that's taking place at that at those intensity levels, you know, approaching VO2 max and above now you're, ha you're trying to teach your body how to tolerate. And it's not the lactate. That's why I don't like that term. You're not tolerating lactate. You're tolerating the acidity, the, the yep, lowering yep. of the pH. And this yep, becomes yep. more important, right, as, you, as you're racing distances at 5,000 and below. Oh, yeah. Like it's, you know, long distance runners might not even be terribly familiar with those terms listening to this because it's not something they venture into training. And I will like definitely admit, I am much more of a long distance coach. I don't train anyone below the 5K, just kind of by nature of the population I attract. So it's definitely not my area of expertise, especially middle distance stuff is tricky because you have to kind of toe that line of are you clearing the lactate? Are you tolerating it? And it's a much, you're going into real acidosis there as you might not with a long distance runner doing cruise intervals. So you can kind of see my bias shaping how I answered that based on the populations I work with and things can look very different in middle distance running um, or, you know, I know 5K is technically long distance, but in those, those track and field distances. Yeah, it's, it's not your, your specialty, but you understand it and you're able to articulate all of this very well. So thank, thank you. you again for, for bearing with me. <laughs> uh, is there a topic that you'd pursue for a thesis or dissertation that you have an interest in or that you think hasn't been looked at closely enough? in the literature and that would have practical implications for practitioners like you and me? That's a great question because I am coming up on my master's thesis within the next 12 months. So it's something I should be thinking really seriously about. Um, you know, quite honestly, I would like to see more research done on training intensity and periodization of those training intensity distributions for recreational runners. There's been a little bit of work on it, um, a few articles done, um, like, you know, 2014, um, 
had a look at polarized training versus more moderate training in long distance runners, but I'd like to look how do these concepts we have looking from elite runners translate the same in your low, like lower to moderate volume recreational runners, or is there a difference? Because right now when we're working, we're using information from high volume elite runners. And that might look different when you have your 40 mile per week recreational marathoner. So I think it'd be really interesting to look into that more. I think that'd be highly valuable for a lot of coaches. Um, you know, part of my, my studies in school are also sports and nutrition. And I always find it very interesting when I have athletes run trail races, they report that they recover more quickly. Obviously trails are softer surfaces than roads, but I always think about how they tend to eat more whole foods with higher macro, higher micronutrient contents and more protein during the race. And I wonder how that affects the recovery rate, if there even is any interaction at all. That's not saying road runners should go eat whole foods during their races to try to recover better because your stomach might not like that. That's not how your body needs energy delivered, but it's just always something I've wondered in the back of my mind. So nutrition, periodization, training intensity, distribution, the latter actually happens to be my favorite topic to study. And from what I've heard, it's also one of the hardest to do research in because you have to follow or track athletes for a really long time to, to yes. really gauge their, right, their improvement curve. Absolutely, like a lot of these studies we've looked at have been longitudinal studies or they take place over very long periods of time. You rely a lot on self-reporting, which makes statistics very messy. Um, and, you know, I, you'll have to excuse me because I can't remember the author of the study, but there was one study within the past five years that talked about how, how we measure training intensity distribution actually affects the percentages we see in each zone. That if you were to take the same athlete and you were to try to calculate their training intensity distribution based on reported RPE, rate of perceived exertion versus heart rate, and then there was like one other metric, you would actually have wildly different training intensity distributions. So how you make, I mean, you know, in the field of science, we're trying to measure it a lot in like um, ventilatory rates, like you mentioned, and that it comes down to like almost RPE, self-reporting. It's very messy. It's a very tricky field. And that's why, you know, we can have all these studies come out and they definitely have their value, but we can't take every single one as absolute gospel. It's more to inform how we shape and manipulate variables. One topic that I'm personally curious about, actually there's two topics, but let, let's start with this one. Is there an optimal volume or at least a suggested upper limit on the amount of time in terms of minutes that someone should spend per session at intensities above the second ventilatory threshold? Yeah, that's a good question. And, you know, I talked earlier about not being too constrained by rules before. What I'm gonna share are kind of guidelines there's wiggle room around them. You know, think of all these things as having standard deviations. Um, so, you know, Dr. Jeff Daniels recommends with um, threshold efforts, so he's talking like pretty much working right at your second ventilatory threshold, that one hour race effort, spending no more than 10% of your training volume there in a singular session. Or, you know, if you're a super high volume runner, that might actually be like no more than 40 to 45 minutes, which might be actually less than 10% of your training volume in that time. Um, and it's a very logical conclusion. If we're thinking that this is our race effort, you don't want to be like doing an hour continuous at that effort because that's not a workout. That's a time trial or a race. Um, so that's kind of, you know, the approach I've had, but then it also gets a little complicated by how you calculate training volume. If you're going by mileage or if you're going by time, um, you might, those might shake out a little bit differently, but that's generally kind of how I've approached is no more than 10%. Um, and if an athlete is doing 40 ish minutes in a session, I tend to break it up a little bit just to keep it 
purposeful and beneficial and not have them teetering too hard or pushing it to kind of time trial it at the end. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up Dr. Jack Daniels because he's the only coach that I have seen. And, and granted, I haven't read everything or everyone. But yeah, I remember him suggesting uh, certain upper limits to mm -hmm. these quality workouts that we do. And I was thinking, you know, a popular workout, let's say mile repeats. Let's, let's say to stay away from mileage, let's just use four to five minute reps which is what the elites would be doing these mile repeats mm -hmm. in, you know, do we cap that at four by five minutes, five by five minutes? Cause I'm thinking there's going to come a point where the benefits of that session are going to end because it's simply too, too much load on the body at mm -hmm. those intensities. Yeah. I mean, that definitely is. And I am trying to think exactly because, but it definitely is like, I tend to give threshold workouts to athletes by time a lot, because if you say five by one mile at second ventilatory threshold, lactate threshold pace, that's a different workout for my, you know, 125 half marathoners and my two hour half marathoners. Um, so I think it's important a lot of times to qualify by time and not by distance. And then I, I agree, like the load is something to factor in <laughs> time by intense, like duration by intensity. And the reason I chuckle is because that's kind of like one of the newer things that we're getting into really questioning in exercise science is um, training impulse load, which sometimes just simply uses duration by intensity, but now they're beginning to question that because it's not this completely linear thing. like even for certain athletes based on their muscle fiber typology, you might have one athlete for whom, you know, three by 10 minutes at lactate threshold is a very tolerable workout because maybe they're just one of those like slow twitch as they come runners who can like recycle, shuttle around that lactate super well. And then if you have someone who is a very fast twitch dominant runner, they might struggle a little bit more in that workout, need a little bit more recovery. Um, and I think that's where the art of coaching comes in is observing from your athletes when you make these prescriptions, how are they reporting they feel in this session? How are they reporting they feel once they finish? And how are they reporting they feel the next day? And sometimes you have to set aside rules like Dr. Daniels and be like, my athlete actually responds in this way. And so for this athlete, maybe they don't handle more than 8% of their total volume at threshold in a singular session. Or maybe this athlete can do 12% and they thrive on it. It's all very observational studies on a sample size of one often. Excellent. Okay, now the other side of this coin, is there any evidence that you've come across that might suggest an upper limit for a recovery run in terms of volume or maybe as a percentage of total workload percentage of weekly mileage because i'm thinking at some point again there has to be a physiological optimum and it's different for every athlete uh, but i don't think i mean if we're going to go to extremes here i don't think someone who runs 120 miles per week which is typical for an elite marathoner mm -hmm. would recover doing a three-hour run even if it's no. very, very slow. I agree. Like there, you know, again, if we talk about training load being duration times intensity, which is overly simplified, even at very low intensities, there is a point where the duration becomes a load in itself. Like, and so if we think about it from a bioenergetics perspective, and a lot of what's kind of informed my interpretation opinion on this comes from studying sports nutrition. Um, I personally don't like easy runs to exceed 75-ish minutes. And I don't like recovery runs to exceed 60 minutes. Obviously those will be scaled based on an athlete's training volume. So for some runners, their recovery runs might actually be only 20, 30 minutes based on the volume they're doing throughout the week. Because I also frame it relative to volume, like generally we're not doing more than 10% in a recovery run of our weekly volume. Generally we're not doing more than like 15 to 18% of volume in an easy run. 
So this is all kind of like that easy run though may vary based on runners who are doing less frequent runs per week. Like if you have a four times per week runner. Um, and the rationale though behind these 75 minutes for an easy run and 60 minutes or less for a recovery run comes to how our bodies use muscle glycogen based on duration of running. Um, so my sports nutrition textbook was sport nutrition by, um, I'm gonna mispronounce the name, um, Asker Joy Kindrup and Michael Gleason. And they talked about how essentially once you begin to surpass an hour, you begin using more muscle glycogen. And we, that's not really our goal on a recovery run. We don't wanna use more glycogen in our muscles, deplete that more. We're coming off of a very hard session that via either volume and or intensity severely depleted our glycogen. Um, so that's kind of the rationale. You can also get into the biomechanical aspects of, you know, the longer you're on your feet, the more muscle breakdown you have, plain and simple physics. And so we don't want muscle breakdown on a recovery run because that's not the goal. Um, so even when I say 60 minutes, like that's my uppermost limit. Most runners I have get 20 to 40 minutes for a recovery run. Yeah, we're very close on that. My, my, my belief is that on a recovery run, you shouldn't exceed 45 minutes, but you know, 45, mm -hmm. 60, we're in the same ballpark. And for me, it's the injury risk and also the glycogen depletion that occurs mm -hmm. once you, and this is coming, Laura, from someone who used to do 90 plus minutes uh, for, for just an easy day during yeah. the middle of the week. So I've, I've come a long way. As a coach, how much consideration do you give to qualities such as foot strike, cadence, or just biomechanics in general? Yeah, so I, I actually don't, it's not, it's not the place of a coach, I think. Um, there's a lot of scientific consensus right now, um, and I should have pulled up the studies before um, I have them on my website, all kind of listed if you Google proper running form on my website, but the scientific consensus is coaches should not change it, especially if the athlete is not constantly injured. If the athlete is repeatedly suffering injuries, that should be within the scope of a physical therapist, um, which is not my scope. I'm not a physical therapist. Um, so that's all to say, I don't change my runner's biomechanics because there's no scientific evidence that I, as a coach, should be tinkering with that. You can give form cues, you know, kind of basic things like, like quick steps, arms driving back, tall upright posture, slight forward lean, but those aren't going in being like you are landing midfoot. I want you to land forefoot. So let's change that. Like everyone's going to have a little bit of biomechanical quirks and it's not the coach's place to tinker with that. Thank you. I couldn't agree more. And I think we need more exercise physiologists talking into the ears of, of coaches because I think it's a big misconception, especially among runners that we serve who are just recreational runners. They think that they're going to perform better if they consciously um, modify their, their running style, so to speak. Um, Laura, can you give an example of a time that maybe you used a certain strategy, mental or physical, with one of your runners that isn't perhaps your norm or your default strategy, but that because of this runner's unique characteristics worked really well? Yeah, I think I mentioned this runner earlier. Um, she's a, a very long-term client. And she came to me at the goal of qualifying for Boston, kind of coming off collegiate running. And we tried kind of the more typically effective strategy of let's do five days, six days of running, higher volume. And she fell, fell short for one reason or another each time. And I'm not one to point at an athlete and be like, you missed your race goal because your mind wasn't in the game. Like a lot of times it's time for me to introspectively look at a coach what could I have done better for you? And she, she has more stress than most people. She's a doctoral student. And so what was really a breakthrough for her is we actually, she actually ran less leading into her 315 marathon. Um, she did four days of running. She had good volume over those four days. I think she 
did most easy runs were right around 75 minutes weekday or the big workout of the week got up to like 90 and then a big long run over the weekend. But she had more recovery built in more time for strength training without doing a run and strength training and the demands of that recovery in both days. And so a lot of people I hear are even like, oh, you can't qualify for Boston off of four days of running. But for some runners, that might actually be appropriate because they need to recover properly between sessions and everyone's recovery rates are very different and very influenced by life stressors. So in her case, would you say it was lifestyle factors maybe that made that approach more optimal for her? And was she able to cross train on some of the other days or was it just like complete rest that worked for her? Yeah, let's see. So it was four days run. Um, of the three days not running, two days were pretty substantial lifts in the very like 70, 75% max way that a lot of the research shows benefits runners and then one day complete rest. Um, I think we tinkered a little bit with cross training, but we found that lifting was just more beneficial for her. It helped her stay injury free, even though the evidence isn't actually hugely supportive of strength training, preventing injury. A lot of anecdotal evidence is, and that was her case. Um, and I think that just kind of helped her fit in the things that kept her injury free recover from her runs and also like have time within her week to be like, I worked on my dissertation. I did my other doctoral student duties and I still got good sleep at night because grad students aren't the best at getting sleep, even in the absence of trying to train. Like, especially when you get doctoral students because their demands are just crazy. I, I love stories like that because it really portrays the art of coaching at its finest. And it's like the quicker we can identify what is the solution for someone like that, the, the better it is, right, for, for the athlete. Mm -hmm. so I think we get better at, at identifying that over time. And speaking of stories, and I know we're, we're getting close to the end here, I oh, thought no. maybe that we would make up a fictional character for purposes yeah. of, you know, getting into a few of the details of training and because of I want to be mindful of your time. Maybe you could just answer these questions in like a rapid fire sort of way, right? Yeah, so yeah, like, I can do that. I know I tend to ramble. <laughs> no, I'm. I could stay here, you know, for another hour, but I want to. I do want to be respectful of your time. You have a toddler at home and all that. So here, here's the scenario. Of, so Jane, let's just make up a name. Jane runs a seven minute mile. That's her current PB for the mile. Okay. And she comes to you and wants to train for a marathon that is six months away. Uh, let's just say it's CIM. Um, and she's not opposed to running some shorter races during that buildup because six months is a long time. She has a PR of 415 for the marathon, which she ran earlier this year on a flat course. She's been running for about three years, let's say, off and on. But when she's training, when she's on, She's running seven times a week, mostly 30 to 40 minute runs, maybe some track work, some 200s, 400s on the track. And she's gotten up to 18 miles or three hour long runs when she's in the meat of her marathon training. Now you can fill in you know, any other details that you might need to answer any of these questions. Are we cool? Yeah, yeah. All right, so then, what would the first phase of training be called, you know, in your coach jargon here? Yeah, so I kind of just call it base training for people, but I feel like that's a really unnuanced term because I typically take a multifaceted base approach. Uh, if you're kind of looking the Canova, Brad Hudson language, introductory phase, we do lots of easy running. We do those hill strides, um, flat strides, neuromuscular work and probably some easy to moderate progression runs just to kind of tax that upper end system when there's not a ton of other high intensity going in, get her onto hills. Um, CIM is a hilly course. Like, yes, it's fast and net downhill, but if you're bad on hills, you're not gonna do too hot at CIM. So I'd want her to feel comfortable with hills early. So a multifaceted base phase. 
Okay, and would you have Jane on a seven day training cycle to start off? I know some coaches prefer a 10 day cycle or even a 14 day cycle. Um, assuming Jane is like your normal 30s ish, 40s ish adult, I would put her on a seven day cycle because I imagine she probably has work and children and these time constraints that would make a 10 day cycle of long runs very difficult for her. So we would do a seven day cycle and she would throw that seventh day of running out the door and rest every seven days. Okay, great. And then within that seven day cycle, what would the training intensity distribution be like? So I know that you favor, you know, a polarized 80, 20 approach, but uh, just to make things a little bit more concrete for our listeners, what would be like the Monday through Sunday breakdown here of, of workouts? Yeah. So kind of like quickly assessing what Jane's doing, probably when we get into marathon training, I would actually favor a pyramidal approach for her. So we'd get a lot of like mostly easy, good amount of zone two, little bit of zone one. Um, so probably, and this is just kind of like what the meat of marathon training, I think would look like Monday, she would do a hilly run. So that's like some intensity teetering into zone two, like mostly easy, but going uphill, you get a little bit more work followed by hill strides. Um, again, I really want her to be comfortable on hills. I really want her to get good force output on hills. Tuesday, easy run. Um, Cause Monday, even though we had some moderate intensity stuff, wasn't too hard. Wednesday would be her big hard workout of the week. And I would probably have her, you know, we'd start marathon training with some shorter stuff, but her area of weakness really seems to be like around her lactate threshold and along the mental aspect of prolonged running her mile PR is much faster than her marathon PR so we need to favor that moderate intensity running so she'd have like a threshold workout tempo run whatever you want to call it on Wednesdays Thursdays would be a recovery run Fridays would be an easy run Saturday would be her long run and that might have some marathon pace running into it running getting into it at the peak and the volume of that would influence her Wednesday workout volume and then Sunday rest. Now, if I started to sense that she wasn't recovering super great, that Thursday run would go out the window and she'd have a rest day or a cross training day. Um, because if she's hovering at 415 for the marathon though, her, you know, with the seven minute mile, she should be able to go under four hours. So she might need some more, more aerobic development or she might just need to recover better. And that's something I kind of have to would assess through training to inform five versus six days. I like it. Okay. And as far as the volume goes, are you trying to steadily increase that? And then you're going to reach at some point a, a plateau uh, of mileage, or are you going to continue to increase that mileage throughout the, the, the phases that, that follow this, this um, introductory one? Yeah. So at first I think we would steadily increase. Um, but then once we get into marathon training more, kind of closer to the race, eight-ish, 10-ish weeks out, I would plateau that and use intensity in the long runs as the real forms of progressing training. Um, we don't want to keep building up mileage while we're trying to progress training, or sorry, progress intensity at the same time in peak marathon training. So I have a lot of marathoners do that. Like we build up their volume to say mid fifties, whatever for the individual. And we hang out a lot of time there with just the long runs and intensity being the building factors and cutback weeks. Yes, great. So that intensity becomes the driver yes, of adaptations um, mm -hmm. once you reach that specific phase of, of yes. training. Great. Okay. Now, what energy systems would you be training during this first phase? And, you know, again, we're, you, you and I both like to touch on all systems. And so you're going to be mm -hmm. emphasizing some more than others, maybe give a few sample workouts. Yeah. So at this, in the introductory phase you're talking about. Yeah. We're still in the introductory phase. Okay. We're still in the introductory phase. Um, not even specifically a energy system, but I want to really tax her neuromuscular system. I know that's not energy, but I just want to say, I want to tax that there. Um, and then probably if we're actually super far out from the race, we're in this introductory phase, like six months out. I know I said I wanted her to do threshold work, but we need a foundation for that first. So I want her to do some aerobic power work to improve 
her like to raise up her lactate threshold and her velocity at VO2 max. In that way, um, assuming it's probably summer, we'd be looking at workouts like I really like one to three minute repeats with equal time rest in the summer because it's probably hot where she's training, takes her a while to recover in between each. We really, really want to do that. Those will help her recover her running economy also. Um, and again, those easy to moderate progression runs that I talked about, um, I think would be really beneficial for her. Like she kind of go from the easy running hill strides progression run phase into um, the running economy velocity at VO2 max phase into a lactate threshold phase into marathon pace with still some tempo runs in there phase she would need to spend a good amount in that marathon pace phase like probably have eight weeks in there though because she is that seems to be an area of weakness for her right yeah and i imagine you're training right now a lot of runners preparing for chicago so we're kind mm -hmm. of like in that early phase of training where they might the training it might actually look more like someone preparing for the 5k or the 10k at this yes. point Oh yeah, especially like balancing summer and just finding that most runners handle intervals a little bit better in summer also than big tempo runs. Um, yeah, I think a lot of my runners are very well familiar with their early marathon training almost looking like a high volume 5K training. Then here's a question, Laura, that I ask all the coaches that come on here and you get all kinds of answers. How, how would you establish Jane's training paces? to start off I mean, you know what kind of shape she's in. I mean, maybe you wouldn't want her to race a mile. Maybe you want some different data here. Yeah, so I think if I was to give her training paces, I would want her to first race something like a 5K a little bit longer. That gives me just a little bit better sense of not just her maximum oxygen uptake and speed, but of the other physiological determinants maybe even a 10K, a 10K would actually be great if she could race that and even, but I know those aren't as easy to find in summer. Um, I would probably give her training paces using the VDOT calculator, but those would be more so guardrails rather than strict, you have to hit these. It's like almost like speed limits, like a no faster than this, but it's summer, you might be a little bit slower. And then I really always like runners to prioritize rate of perceived exertion. It's a skill, it takes calibration, but it really yields dividends, especially when you begin training in summer, it's hot, and then you enter fall and you have this confluence of the weather is calming down and your adaptations are starting to present in training. Um, having RPE just always make sure you're working in the right zone, regardless of how you're adapting to training, regardless of weather, regardless of training fatigue accumulated. Awesome, yeah, so you are reminding them to pay attention to those sensory signals, the, mm -hmm. the RPE, perceived exertion, that goes hand in hand with their training paces. All right, great. So then would you add any supplemental training? So I think Jane is doing enough eat, like volume of running if she's gonna do six days to not need aerobic cross training. However, she could probably benefit from lifting weights once per week, I'd say to start, uh, kind of going for a minimal dose type thing, but she could probably see big dividends from the benefits that that confers upon running economy. And since it'd be a really novel stimulus for her, it would probably have quick reward. And would you start that lifting with uh, maximal strength type lifting, like heavy squats, heavy deadlifts, or would it be more uh, functional type strength? So we probably start her in a functional type strength, um, part because her technique is likely lacking. Um, but I would probably start her off in almost what they consider a hypertrophy training phase, which sounds really funny for runners, but a lot of the research shows that it's that, like what would be the equivalent of like 65 to 80% of your one rep max is kind of a great place for runners and cyclists and endurance athletes to work. You're not gonna actually get hypertrophy because of, the interference effect on a cellular level, but you will kind of work both maximal strength, power, and muscular endurance at the same time. Um, she might 
start out not quite at that level as she learns good form, but that's kind of where I would want to get her to. Um, and, she, you know, for her not being super strength trained, she could probably get to that pretty easily at home with just kettlebells or dumbbells or whatever she has. Okay, sounds good. And then in Jane's case, she's a relatively new runner. She's been running for three years. Mm -hmm. She does have some race experience, but what are your thoughts around helping runners gain more race experience? How often should they race in a buildup like this one? Yeah, so it would kind of depend on um, how we're approaching the races. Like if we're approaching them as all out true race efforts, I would say she could probably race every four to six weeks early on, but then as she gets closer to the marathon, not race as often, maybe do a tune up half marathon four to six weeks out from the race. And, you know, but in the introductory phase, she could do a 5k, 10k every four to six weeks. I think it would benefit her because it sounds like maybe pacing might be an issue for her if her there's such a discrepancy between her mile pace and her marathon finish time. Agree. Yeah, completely agree. And we know that the biggest threat to someone like Jane, apart from staying consistent with your training, is mm -hmm. injury. So how, yep. how would you be advising her to... I think the big one here is sleep. Would you agree? Yeah, sleep and eating enough. I think sometimes new runner or relatively newer runners don't actually realize how much they need to eat in marathon training or how their macronutrients should be portioned and timed in training. Um, so, you know, here's some runners worry about gaining weight in marathon training. And that can happen if you like don't eat enough and then all of a sudden binge, but she, I think she could probably benefit from making sure she eats enough, especially gets enough protein, which can be actually quite a high need for endurance runners to prevent injury. And last one, as you're moving into phase two, phase three, these later stages of the training plan, you know, you've got eight weeks to go, something like that. How is training different? Yeah. So she'd be moving more specific work as the race gets closer. So phase two be probably like cruise intervals, some continuous threshold runs. Phase three would be some threshold training stacked with marathon pace work. A lot of marathon pace work, I think for her um, with the long runs getting progressively longer. If she did start lifting, we'd wanna kind of hold that steady through phase two, back it off in phase three, because her training demands would be higher um because you know you can stop strength training for like six weeks and still maintain the benefits and that's what some runners need in late phase three into the taper um and I think also for her she would just really need to work on fueling in her long runs I know that's not like a specific physiological thing but she needs to get comfortable taking in fuel like she would on race day in phase three. We would keep those strides though and hill strides going all the way through and she would be doing hills on some day of the week, maybe multiple all the way through because that cannot be a weak link in her chain going into CIM. And I like about a two week taper, right? Give, give or take exponential taper, reducing the volume, but maintaining the trends, the uh, intensity and the frequency. Do you agree? Yeah. So usually for athletes, I do either a two week taper or like, this is going to sound weird, but like you have a week where volume does like a cutback, like it goes to like 85, 90%, but they still have a big marathon pace workout that week. Then they do you know, 60, 65% volume, still intensity, but a little bit less intensity to scale that than race week. Um, kind of depends on the runner, whether we do the two week or the graduated three week. I don't like a sharp three week taper where things, you know, really scale back for three whole weeks. I find that leaves an athlete really flat on race day. And Laura, yet again, another master, masterful summary of a six month buildup to a marathon. Thank you so much for your keen insights today and for being so generous with your time. You're just such a pleasant person to talk to. 
Thank you. I mean, thank you so much for having me. It's been a wonderful interview. I really enjoyed that last exercise and I'm still kind of mulling over it more, but yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. And if someone would like to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, um, so you can get in touch with me through my website. There's a contact form on there. Um, my email is also up on there. So that's lauranorrisrunning.com. You can also contact me through my Instagram um, at Laura Norris Running. Great. So I'll post that in the show notes. And once again, Laura, you are phenomenal. Keep doing great things. And till next time, thank you, everyone. Well, we did it, Laura. Thank you. That was like great questions. That was probably one of the best podcast I've been on I was I liked that last exercise a lot yeah I've been thinking about maybe doing more rapid fire style questions and I always ask coaches now at the end if there's any anything I can do to make the experience better for others you know I'm always open to to feedback because I want this to be coaching education at large yeah I, I I thought it was really really well structured I thought the questions were fantastic um, and like the, I think those rapid fire exercises are really fun. Like it kind of puts you out of your comfort zone and puts you like in a real thinking space, um, which is really good. Okay. Did having the questions in advance help you? Yes, it does okay. help me. Cause I, I'm the type who I, I rely on books a lot. Like I can't remember everything. So I did like sketch out things beforehand, look at books, make sure I had, I mean, I didn't have all my studies properly cited, but tried to have have them decently well um and it helps you to have them like on the the screen um because sometimes i hear a noise in the background and i might like miss something but it helps me to be able to reference them as i talk all right so this is going to get published uh, you know by tomorrow it'll be up oh, awesome i can send you the link to that via email and can i bug you with one more question mm -hmm. yeah i Definitely. didn't want this to be part of the interview but so I'm my forte, I would say, is training marathoners who are in like the the, the two something, three something range. Mm -hmm. If you have someone that is is preparing for like a five hour marathon, how long of a run would you build up to? Because sometimes I think giving them, you know, a four or five hour long run at their peak is just overkill. That is a great question because honestly it's one that I feel like I struggle with a lot in coaching. It's one I know a lot of other coaches have debating opinions on. Um, so usually I think what I found is best is we might do like a three and a half hour long run. Um, maybe if they're one of those people who just has off the charts recovery, they might get a four hour one, but I am not entirely comfortable with that, but it's, it's really tricky because you want to make sure that they can handle their fueling for that long, that they know how to like be out there for a long time. And a lot of them won't have great confidence if they stick to only three hours, which might be like 14 miles for some. Um, I have had some luck treating them more like ultra runners than marathoners um, because their race kind of kind of is from a physiological standpoint. So I have for ones who are amenable to it, I have had good luck doing back-to-back -back long runs. Like maybe at our peak, we do like three hours one day and two hours the next, or even, you know, three hours one day, 90 minutes the next. That I have found works tremendously well, but not every five hour marathoner wants to do that. Um, so yeah it's there it's it's a tricky demographic to train yeah but that that gives me something to think about i like the back to back and i've always said i'm echoing what you just said five hour marathoners are actually ultra marathoners yeah 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 um so i'm gonna let you get back to uh to <laughs> daily life but I, I mean I, you're a friend of the show forever so anything you need you let me know okay Thank you. And same to you. Let me know if you need anything at any point. And thank you so much for, for having me on and everything. All right. Well, take care, Laura. Take care. You too.